Today we'll speak about Paticca Samupada for the, the, the last part of Paticca Samupada. In the, in the Pali scriptures, there are two, two versions of what happened on the night of the Buddha's enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. In one version that appears in some places, it tells of how the Buddha realized the, the Devicca, the three knowledges. The first of which was to realize the knowledge of re reviewing his former lives, that this one being had gone through many, many lives until coming up to the present one, and that the Buddha supposedly reviewed all these past lives. And then the second of these knowledges was to see how beings have create actions, karma, and then must must receive the results of those karma. And this is always interp this is always presented as seeing beings dying and being reborn in this or that that state. And then the third of these knowledges was the knowledge that the the asava, the eruptions had been completely destroyed. The eruptions are like, to, to destroy the eruptions means that defilement will never again occur. So this was the knowledge of the, the ending of defilement. This is one explanation of what occurred on that, the night of the Buddha's defilement, supposedly the realization of these three, three vichas like this. Then in another place in the scriptures, it gives a different version. In this one, on the first watch of that night, the first four hours of that night, the Buddha examined Bhatitya Samupada in the, the forward order, or it's called with the, with the grain, meaning starting with avicca, Avita is the condition for sankhara, all the way up through upadana, bhava, birth, and dukkha. Then for the second watch of that night, he reviewed Bhatitya Samupada in the reverse order. Dukkha has birth as its condition, birth has existence as its condition, and then against the grain, all the way back to ignorance. This was the second watch. And then for the third watch, he examined Bhatitya Samupada in both forward order and then reverse, with the grain and then back against the grain until, until dawn. So in a certain, in some places in the, the Pali scriptures, this is what is said to have happened on the during the night of the enlightenment. When we've got two versions like this, the second one is the one we ought to accept because it's, it's much more reasonable. This first knowledge, the first vicha, that of reflecting upon or reviewing one's past lives, this is basically what we call satsada titi, the view of eternally existing beings or eternalism, the belief in an eternal soul that goes on and on being reborn over and over again. This satsada titi in Buddhism is considered to be a wrong view, but it's basically the view of the Upanishads. So in this vicha here, it's basically just presenting this, the typical view of before the Buddha's time. The second 
jnana, that of beings having committing karma and then having to go or live according to that karma. This is not really a Buddhist principle. In Buddha, the Buddhist teaching on karma is to stop karma, to end karma, to be above karma, to be above actions, to not be trapped within the power of karma. But as it's presented here, beings dying and being reborn <coughs> according to their karma, this, this is to be trapped by karma. It's not to be free of karma, which to be free of it is what the Buddha taught. So these first two knowledges, as they're recorded in certain places in the scriptures, are not really Buddhist principles. They're not really the basic principles of Buddhism. But what we might be able to ex accept is that whoever it was that wrote down these passages of the scriptures, or whoever was the first one to speak them or who wrote them down, or maybe when somebody copied them, these were added, that these, these first two vichas were included for, for the sake of ordinary people, people who couldn't understand Bhatitya Samupada, and so they were given these simple things for the sake of morality to help the ordinary common people for their benefit. And so these things we can accept that these were probably put in for this reason. But we should not accept these two things as fundamental Buddhist teachings. The first of these two vichas or knowledges. The other version that where the Buddha for the first or the Buddha, the almost Buddha, for f the first watch of the night, that means for four hours, examine carefully reviewing Bhatitya Samupada in the upward order from ignorance is the condition for Sankara, Sankara is the condition for consciousness and so on, up the way, all the way up until Dukkha. He reviewed this for, spent four hours going over this, over and over again. This is the birthing, the how Dukkha is born, all these successive births, up until the birth of Dukkha. He reviewed this carefully. Then in the second watch, for another four hours, in very careful detail, reviewed it in the reverse order. This is dukkha. Where does dukkha come from? Dukkha comes from birth. Where does birth come from? Du birth comes from bhava, existence. Where does existence come <clears throat> from? All the way back until the original thing that starts it off, avicca. So carefully taking it in the reverse order. Then for the last four hours of that night, it carefully examining, examining Bhatitya Samupada both in the forward order from ignorance to dukkha and then the reverse order from dukkha back to ignorance, upward and downward, upward and downward for another four hours. This, this shows the, the importance of Bhatitya Samupada that the Buddha would spend all 12 hours of the, the enlightenment experience re going through Bhatitya Samupada in these various ways. So this, this clearly emphasizes the, the profundity of Bhatitya Samupada, the subtlety of it, the, the exquisiteness of it, and the great importance of it. The words that I was translating forward and backward or forward and reverse are in Pali, Anu Lom and Bati Lom. Loma means hair, and so with the hairs and against the hairs is what they literally translate as. 
But this can still be a bit ambiguous and people don't quite know what it means. So we can take that anulom, or the forward order, is the, the arising, the arising of Paticca Samupada. So we can call the first, the anulom, the forward order, the Paticca Samupada, dependent origination. Then the reverse of that, the Bhati Loma, is the the seizing, the seizing, the seizing, the seizing, which is we can take to be Paticca Nirota, as we talked about the other day. And then the third watch of the night was both going through both Paticca Samupada and Paticca Nirota. And in, in the third watch of the night, he examined both, both the upward and the downward, the Paticca Samupada, the arising order, and the Paticca Nirota, the seizing order. So the question <coughs> occurs, have, have you ever tried to do this? Have you ever tried to examine Paticca Samupada in the way that the Buddha has? So we, we suggest to you, or we leave it up to you, to, to consider whether it would be worthwhile to follow the Buddha's example and examine, consider, check out Paticca Samupada in this great detail, both in the sense of but, but dependent origination and dependent extinguishing or dependent seizing. We'd like to interject at this time of something about karma, because we just mentioned how in the supposed second vicha, the Buddha was seeing how beings die and are reborn according to their karma. We'd like to point out that that isn't really the Buddhist teaching on karma. That's just the standard version of karma that existed before the Buddha's time. As explained there, that beings create actions, perform actions, and then must inevitably receive the results of those actions. This was a teaching that existed before the Buddha, and it was most perfectly expressed in the, the, the Sanskrit scriptures, which are called the Upanishads. This was a teaching which existed before the Buddha. When the Buddha appeared, he did not dispute it. He did not, he did not deny it. But he went further and said that there in Buddhism, the real teaching of Buddhism is to not have to be trapped by one's, one's karma or by the karma. The idea that doing good at deeds leads to good results and doing bad actions leads to bad results is called Gamawati or the, the theory of karma. And, this, and it was a, a basic teaching that existed before the Buddha. The Buddha came and said that's not enough. To really be free, one has to be free of this karma. So that, which means by practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, by following the Noble Eightfold Path, one is free of good karma and bad karma. And so, any results of karma have no, no power over one. And so to be above the influence, beyond the influence of karma, it, which we call no karma or the end of karma, where that any karma has no power to, no power over one. This is what the Buddhist teaching on karma is. However, this is a point that's largely misunderstood. Most of these books being written about karma in rebirth or these books about Buddhism, especially the ones by Western scholars, where they've got their chapter on karma in rebirth, they're not talking about Buddhism. They've just taken karma 
as it's taught in the Upanishads and then claim incorrectly that this is what Buddhism taught. And so we've got over and over again, it's repeated, just this very simple formula, good deeds lead to good results, bad deeds lead to bad results, and one, one inevitably must receive the fruits of one's karma, whether it's good or bad. This is a, a pre-Buddhist teaching. It's not really the Buddhist teaching, but all these books about Buddhism have, have got it wrong. And so it's, it's quite difficult nowadays for people to get things explained properly. So anyway, the Buddhist teaching on karma is to be free of karma, to end it, so that karma has no more meaning, no more value, no more power over our lives. This is what the Buddha taught, and we wanted you to have a chance to do this. In mentioning this issue of karma, this is an example of what in Buddhism is called asanantana tam, things that have been taught for, for since way back when, things that have been taught for a long time, which means that in that Buddhism has accepted a, quite a few things that were taught way before the Buddhist time. When the Buddha arose, there were a large number of teachings of things in India. And the Buddha didn't, didn't deny them all. There were a number of things that were sufficiently correct for him to, to accept them, at least on some level. So there are many things the Buddha accepted. And then if it wasn't, a, if it wasn't yet complete, he then finished that, that teaching off and completed it, perfected it as with, with karma. These, the teaching of karma that had been taught up until the Buddha's time was not incorrect. It was correct on a certain level. The level it was appropriate for the understanding of ordinary people and it led to morality. So it was, a, it was in terms of morality and relative truth, it was correct. However, to have a full and complete understanding of karma, it was necessary for the Buddha to teach further about being above karma, being beyond karma. And so he perfected the teaching on karma to the level that we call loguttara, which is to be above the world. The ordinary teachings are called logia, they're teachings for living in the world for a mind that is still trapped within worldly conditions. And then there are teachings of Loguttara for the mind that is freed from worldly conditions. And so with quite a number of things, the Buddha accepted the old teaching and then completed it, perfected it, as with karma, as with, with non-violence, with um, the certain meditation practices called the, the jhanas, which were deep states of meditation, these deep of concentration. These were taught, and a number of other things were taught before the Buddha's time. He accepted them and then improved them or perfected them. And so in this way, within the Buddhist teachings are included many <coughs> things that existed before the Buddha's time. This is a, a point that will help us to understand what's, what's happening with these various teachings and to not confuse the old version and the new improved version. If we constantly have to go along according to karma, if we're constantly under the power of karma, then we're trapped in the prison of karma, and there can never be any liberation. If the only possibility is to always be under karma's power, then there's no such thing as liberation. So this isn't, this isn't the Buddhist 
teaching, if there's the Buddhist teaching is all about liberation. And so there's, for it to be the Buddha's teaching, there has to be a way to be free of karma, to get liberated, to be liberated from karma, or vimuti, vimuti, liberation. And so if it's a Buddha, Buddhist teaching on karma, it has to include how to, it must include liberation from karma, not just constantly being trapped in karma forever. So this is the meaning of the words the Buddha, the Buddha perfected these teachings. He, he took the kind of karma that doesn't explain liberation and perfected it until there was also the liberation from karma. This is the same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ said that I haven't come to, to end or to, I don't remember the exact quote, but to, to finish off the old teachings. I've come only to perfect the scriptures. And so Christ didn't say you have to get rid of all the Jewish teachings. He just came to improve them, to perfect them, to make them more appropriate for mankind, which is <clears throat> in the same, the same way as what the Buddha did, especially with the teaching of karma, to not only teach being, having to always receive the, the results of karma, but also the ending of karma, the transcending of karma, which is the perfection of the teaching of karma. So you can see there are two levels of teaching. The first level is the worldly, is the the morality level, the worldly level of teaching for the sake of morality. This is the teaching for those people who still believe in a self, who are still clinging to the self. And so it's a teaching of how to have morality in order to live in the world in a peaceful way, how to get along, how to survive in this world. This is the moral teaching of the worldly level. But then there's the higher level of teaching, that of ultimate truth, where there's, there's understanding that the self does not really exist. So it's a level of teaching on how to be totally free, free of the self, free of all dukkha. This is the loguttara, the, the transcendent teaching for living above the world, free of the world. It's necessary to have both levels of teaching. For some people, they can only, they even have trouble understanding the first level, and so they never would be able to understand the second. So it's necessary to have this moral teaching. But there are some who, who are ready for the complete teaching of, of transcendence, of liberation, and so we must have both. If one understands them both, then we'll see that there's, there's no contradiction between the two, that they, they're not in any conflict, that these two levels of teaching, that of morality and that of liberation, of worldly and transcendent, they, they can go together. There's no, there's no conflict between the two. And so then it's, it's up, up to you. What, what you want. If you'd like to continue just walking along in the world in the, the ordinary way with a self, with a soul attached to this and to that, if one wants to continue in a worldly way, then one can take the Bhatichya Samupada teaching on the, of the, the moral version that was taught by Buddha Gosa. You can follow that one in order to continue in a worldly way, but with morality, so that, that self you've still got is, is relatively peaceful. Or, if one wants to be free, one wants to, to transcend the world and no longer be trapped by all these things, if one's interested in limit, liberation, <coughs> then there's the, the Bhatichya Samupada of ultimate truth, 
which we've been talking about. One can, it's up to, up to us, there are these two levels of Paticca Samupada. We can choose the one that suits our interests, that suits our needs. We've got them both there and so it's, it's up to us which one we're going to follow. <clears throat> now we should say something about the formulas of Paticca Samupada. There are two basic formulas that we have and we've discussed them both. There's the long complete formula beginning with with avicca ignorance and then concocting consciousness, mind, body, the sense media, then contact, feeling, craving, attachment, existence, birth, and dukkha. This is the long and complete version. Then there's the the shorter version that starts with patsa, with that sense contact. There's sense contact and then feeling, craving, attachment, existence, birth, and dukkha. The first <coughs> one is long and complete, and for theoretical purposes it's 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 fine. But the second one is the most practical. The second one is completely practical. And so we should see that there are these two formulas and then know how to use the one that is most appropriate for our, our daily practice. There's something quite interesting about this second formula of Paticca Samupada. The Buddha, although he was a perfectly enlightened Buddha, still recited to himself this formula of Paticca Samupada. He would review it and say it to himself. It's kind of like with ordinary people when we're, we're doing things and maybe in a good mood we, we sing to ourselves or we hum to ourselves. Often without really intending to do so, it just kind of comes out. In certain situations we just a song comes up and we sing or hum. For the Buddha it was kind of like this. And so we, we sometimes call this second version the, the humming, the humming version of Paticca Samupada. Because the, the Buddha would just kind of recite it or, or chant it to himself. When I and form, the two to come together, I consciousness arises. These three conditions are called patsa. Patsa causes vetana. Vetana causes craving. Craving causes upadana. Attachment causes existence. Existence causes birth. Birth causes dukkha. And he would just he would just kind of sing this to himself or recite it to himself. And so we like to call it the humming version of Bhatitya Samupada. But this is something we we came up with on our own. It's not it's not mentioned in this it's not called this mm -hmm. anywhere in the the scriptures. But there was one time when the Buddha was was he thought he was alone sitting in a quiet place and he was he was going through this version of Bhatitya Samupada in this way the way we just we just recited in Pali and he was reciting it and it turned out there was a a monk nearby who who had somehow heard the Buddha and so then the Buddha noticed this monk he says oh what are you doing here and he said oh don't worry about it Remember this, remember this, or use the word, take this, take this. And so the Buddha went through and, and had this monk take it away and, and do it. The Buddha called this, this humming version of Bhatitya Samupada, he called it the Ati Pramajan, which means the beginning of the Brahmacharya. The Brahmacharya is the the sublime life or the 
the true spiritual life when life is lived in the the highest possible way. He called this short version of Paticca Samupada the beginning of the spiritual life. And it was something he liked to, to hum to himself when he had some free time when he was on his own. So we should understand that these there's these two two versions or two approaches the sh- long in the short of the teacher Samupada. Would you like to have a little choral a little choral singing oh, will <laughs> repeat after <laughs> us? Dakunja Vatitcha Vatitcha Rupecha Upachati Vinyanam Innan Thammanam Sankati Patso Sankati Patso Patsa Pachaya Patsa Pachaya Vedana 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 Pachaya Vedana Pachaya Danha 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 Pachaya Danha Pachaya Upadanam Upadanam Upadana Pachaya Upadana Pachaya Bhavo Bhavo Bhava Pachaya Bhava Pachaya Chati 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 Pachaya Chati Pachaya Ramaranam Charamaranam The ordinary school child will recite things in order to memorize them because of being afraid of forgetting these things repeated over and over again to get it completely memorized. But for the Buddha, there is no danger whatsoever of forgetting this because it's it's a perfectly enlightened Buddha and so there's no chance that this could be forgotten. But still, almost maybe unconsciously, subconsciously, this this just comes out, which shows how important it is that there's no need to memorize it, but still it's great importance. It just spontaneously is is recited by by even the Buddha. And so we've got these two formulas of Paticca Samupada. We've got the long one and the short one. The short one is very concise. It's not too long. There's not too much to remember. It's not too difficult to understand. And it's something we can remember and work on and recite, reflect upon in daily life. And then we've got the long version, which is very theoretical. And it's actually more more than we need. It's It's useful. But in terms of our, our daily life, this, this short version is most appropriate. It's, it's, it's manageable. And it, it fits with our, our needs. So we've got these two versions and we should know, know how to use them. So now we've got this word, the ati. Brahmacharya. Ati means starting point. Brahma means sublime or sub- excellent, supreme. Charya is conduct, behavior, or way of life. So Brahmacharya is the supreme way of life, the sublime, the most excellent way of acting and behaving and living. Ati is the starting point of this most excellent and supreme way of life. But teaches Samupada, the short formula of Paticca Samupada is the Ati Brahmacharya, the, the starting point for the true spiritual life. But it's quite unfortunate that where, when we should start spiritual practice by studying and understanding Paticca Samupada like this, because it's the starting point, Nowadays, people are claiming that this is too difficult for people to understand, that this shouldn't be taught. It's actually claimed 
by a number of senior monks that this should never be taught to ordinary people because they're too stupid to, to understand it. And this is most unfortunate because how can people begin spiritual practice without this, this understanding? Or if Bhatichas Samupadaya is taught, they, they bring out this old cumbersome version that was taught by Buddha Gosa, which is overly theoretical and speculative and which is actually impossible to understand. So far, nobody has been able to really explain it. And so, if that's all we've got, it's very, we've got a very sad situation. Because if we don't have this starting point for the Brahmajariya, are we ever going to have the Brahmajariya? And so, we encourage you to, to take this starting point for the supreme way of life and take it and use it as the Ati Brahmacharya. This is a starting point both in terms of study, as we're doing now, and practice. Not just, it's not just a theoretical thing, it's the starting point both of study and practice. <clears throat> it may seem a bit strange to you, that the Buddha said that this was the most, that Paticca Samupadaya is the most profound thing, that it's very, very, very profound. And then he goes and says it's the starting point as well. Paticca Samupadaya is both the starting point and then it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and becomes incredibly profound. There's no contradiction here. If if we understand it. It begins with the way this it begins, the starting point is the eye and the form. The two come together and then there's eye consciousness. And this is patra. The eye, the form, eye consciousness, contact. This happens many, many times in a day. This is not so difficult to see. This is not a very difficult thing. This is something everyone is capable of starting with. So this is the starting point, and it's, it's one we can all actually do. And then from this starting point, it goes deeper to feeling, vetana, and then craving, and then it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And it starts to get difficult with understanding upadana, attachment and then bhava, existence, and then it gets deeper and deeper. But the starting point is well within everyone's ability, and then we, we go and follow it as it gets deeper and deeper. Then, in the exact way that it is with the eyes and forms, there's the ear, and there are sounds, and then ear consciousness, and then that's ear contact ear patsa, and then vetana, danha, and so on. And then the same with the nose and smells, nose consciousness, then there's nose contact, feeling, danha, upadana, and so on. And then with the tongue and tastes and tongue consciousness, the body touches body consciousness, the mind mind objects and mind consciousness. The same, the same principle works, is applied at all six of these sense doors. We've got these eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. This means we've got this, a nervous system. This nervous system is the place where we begin to study Paticca Samupada or we just say spiritual practice, the Ati Brahmacharya, starts with the nervous system. We don't have to start our study with books, with ceremonies, with rituals, with, with offerings or any of that stuff. We just begin with the nervous system, with these eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind, which are complete. 
they're here, they're functioning. They're able to experience things perfectly well. We start our study with this, and then we begin, we, we have an inner spiritual experience. We make inner spiritual experience of, these, of the nerve, how the nervous system works. Not by thinking, not by reading books and studying neurobiology, but by just experiencing within what the nervous system does, how it works. We can have a, a thorough and complete experience of this right here by ourselves. All the tools we need are here, they're complete. And then we just follow through with that experience. We keep making a spiritual experience that goes deeper and deeper and deeper into Paticca Samupada. We've got everything we need to do this, but nobody ever does it. We've got, we don't need anything special to make this study. All of us are, are, have functioning, functioning nervous systems. And so that's, we've got exactly what we need to start spiritual practice. But nobody's ever, nobody ever gets around to it. All the spiritual experiences that one has had in the past can be used. They, these have a lot of value. We can use them to help us to understand Bhaticcha Samupada. All the spiritual experience we've had since birth up until now, all of it that we're able to remember, we can now use to help us to understand Bhaticcha Samupada. And then it won't be so difficult to understand this. So we don't have to throw away all those previous experiences. But now we, we use them and we go, we can now get directly into the study of Paticca Samupada. So now, all the, all the necessary details of Paticca Samupada are, are complete. We've given you all the details you need. And now we'll, con next, we'll, we'll summarize the essence of Paticca Samupada. So please, please get yourselves ready to listen carefully. First, e tapajayata conditionality is applied to all things, especially all ma to all material things. But Paticca <coughs> Samupada, dependent origination, is applied to mental matters to the concerns of the mind, especially problems of the mind. Second, the original Paticca Samupada taught in the, the original scriptures we use for the sake of ultimate truth, for liberation. This is the Buddha's version. The later version as interpreted by the commentaries we use for this purpose of morality or relative truth. Three, the, the original version, the correct version of the Buddha of Bhaticcha Samupada will have many cycles within one life. There will be many spins of Bhaticcha Samupada in one life. But the new version, the new and incorrect version, one, one cycle of it takes up many lives. The Buddha's version, the correct version, in one life there are many, <coughs> many cycles of Bhaticcha Samupada, even in one day there are many. But in the incorrect version, it takes many lives for one cycle. Fourth, if the version of Bhaticcha Samupada that spans a number of lives, how could we control that? If it takes many lives, how can right here and now, how can we control that? How can we govern that? 
how can we practice it? But then the version that although there may be in one life many, many cycles of Bhatichya Samupada, that's within our ability to control it. So one version of Bhatichya Samupada is impractical. It cannot be practiced. And then the other version of Bhatichya Samupada is practical. It's within everyone's ability to practice. In one turn of Bhatichya Samupada, there are de the defilements of avicca ignorance, dhanha craving, and upadana attachment. These three things we call gilesa or defilement. And then there is karma or action at sankara, concocting, patsa, contact, and bhava, existence. These three are called karma. And then as far as vipaka, the results of karma, we've got vijnana consciousness, namarupa, mind-body, the ayatana, the sense media, and then Vedana feeling is the yeah. result is another result and chati birth <laughs> chara marana aging and death sogatewa body tewa all sorrow lamentation and all dukkha and so there is all of these are complete there is defilement kilesa there is action karma and then the results of karma, vipaka. All three of these are complete within Bhaticca Samupada. And so there's no need to rearrange the original order. The original sequence that the Buddha taught is fine. There's, there's defilement, action, result, defilement, action, result, built right in to the original order. There's no, no need to rearrange it and re-explain it in some new and complicated way, the way that Buddha Gosa has done in the Visuddhimagga. That just confuses everything. But Teacher Samupada has the intention of destroying Atavadupadana, which is attaching to words about self clinging to the idea of I in mind. This is the root, the basic fundamental attachment. But Ticca Samupada is a very exquisite, refined explanation of anatta, not self. And this is meant to help to free us <coughs> of this attachment to I in mind, attachment to self. This is the purpose, the, the aim of Bhatichya Samupada. Further, Bhatichya Samupada causes us to meet the genuine Buddha. Just as the Buddha said, whoever sees Bhatichya Samupada sees the Dhamma, whoever sees the Dhamma sees Bhatichya Samupada. And he said, Whoever sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. Whoever to see the Buddha, one must see the Dhamma. So Bhatichya Sumupada cuts down the curtains of ignorance. And then we see that the, the genuine Buddha has been sitting here all along. Bhatichya Sumupada, and by the way, when we just say Bhatichya Sumupada, we also mean Bhatichya Nirotai at the same time, but it, it's shorter to just say Bhatichya Samupada. Bhatichya Samupada is scientific, but it's a spiritual science, similar to material science, but Bhatichya Samupada is a spiritual science which goes beyond mere physical science, such as chemistry and all, and all that. But teaches Samupada is the most excellent, it's the supreme 
science and through understanding it one will see that physically there is no birth and no death that really physical birth and physical death are just illusions they're they're not real that birth and death are purely spiritual matters the science of Paticca Samupada will reveal this. Paticca Samupada is a science, it's not a philosophy. But if one wants, one can take it and drag it through the dirt of philosophy and just and get addicted to it and play with it and have fun. But Paticca Samupada does not depend on logic, does not depend on speculation, on induction and deduction. Paticca Samupada is meant to be a science that is verified through investigation, e experiment, and direct spiritual experience. And so in short, the Paticca Samupada is the large noble truths. The noble truths are the summary of the Buddha's teaching, but Ticca Samupada <clears throat> is the large, the detailed, very exquisite, refined version of the Four Noble Truths. It's the same thing, it's just a larger, more detailed explanation. But Ticca Samupada explains dukkha, suffering, and the cause of dukkha. And then Bhatitya Nirota explains the cessation of dukkha and the way, the method of extinguishing dukkha. So we've got the the big four noble the big noble truths, which is Bhatitya Samupada, Bhatitya Nirota. And then we've got the the little noble truths, which is to is very very short and condensed version of dukkha, the cause of dukkha, the end of dukkha, and the way leading to the end of dukkha. Paticca Samupada, Paticca Nirota, is the, the large, detailed, exquisite, refined version of the noble truth. But it's the same, it's the same <laughs> matter. To study the large Arya Satcha, Arya Noble Satcha Truth, one has to be willing to put in a lot of en energy and effort. You have to give it a lot of time to study and then practice the large noble truths, the Bhatitya Samupada, Bhatitya Nirota. To study the small noble truths doesn't take so much time and energy. But if you want to understand the large version, you'll have to give it a lot of time and energy. To, it takes a moderate amount of time and energy to study the little noble truths, but for the big ones, it takes quite a bit. And we hope you're you're willing to give it that time and energy. <clears throat> We've been. This series of talks is is called all aspects of Buddhism. is called Buddhism in all aspects. So, so far we've talked about Paticca Samupada in sufficient detail. And then next we'll continue by talking about the Four Noble Truths directly. So now this will be the end of today's talk.